Kia ora koutou. Ngami koutou. I'm Alina Siegfried and welcome to this webisode on building farm resilience as part of the Our Regenerative Future series. Wonderful to have you here. Um, again, my name is Alina. I'm the author of the Our Regenerative Future series produced in partnership with Pure Advantage and Edmund Hillary Fellowship. And over the past six months or so, I've taken a deep dive into the world of regenerative agriculture. Um, it started out as um, an idea to write a few stories about carbon sequestration and some of the farmers that were uh, employing regenerative methods on their farms and snowballed quite quickly into a 15 part content series um, published on Pure Advantage and Edmund Hillary Fellowship's blog on Medium and has spun out six or seven actually webinars um, by now. So we launched a series of six to begin with and found that the conversation and dialogue around regenerative agriculture and regenerative economy in general was, um, was such that we decided to launch another six webinars. So this is number two of that second series. Um, and in the next few weeks, we'll be just looking at themes like regenerative forestry, regenerative tourism and, and urban agriculture as well. Um, and the recognition that it's, it's not all upon farmers to be solving our climate change and other environmental woes and that we all have a, a part to play in creating a more regenerative and sustainable economy for New Zealand um, and bringing about the kind of systems level strategies that we need to go into the future. So today we are on the farm and we are discussing farm resilience in all its forms with two wonderful panellists, which I'll introduce to you quickly. Um, Greg Hart, along with his wife Rachel, is transitioning their traditional sheep and cattle farm uh, station into a farm with um, regenerative farming systems. So they're restoring, planting trees, sequestering carbon and building healthy soil. Mangarara Station near Ellsthorpe in the Hawke's Bay is also known as the Family Farm and it's a 610 hectare property that's an open to public living example of regenerative agriculture which is really neat. They've got an eco lodge there so you can go and see what's going on. Greg is a Bachelor of Agriculture from Massey and has previously worked in the in agribusiness consultancy, livestock export and grain marketing. Gary Williams is a water and soil engineer a biodynamic farmer, permaculture activist and teacher, and a natural philosopher. He's the author of sev uh, several books, and along with his partner, Emily, um, has been living on a small farm where they run a diverse array of farming and forestry activities, from home gardens, orchards, staple crops, animal grazing, firewood and plantation forests, and wilderness teaching. So he's a long time guru in this space. Um, wonderful to have you both uh, on the panel today. Um, I see that everybody seems to have voted in our poll, which is fantastic, thank you. Uh, we've got a good mix of people on the call today. So 36% farmers and growers, which is a little lower than we usually have, but we've got others um, from science and academia, business media and other. So it's fantastic to see such a, a wonderfully diverse group here today. Um, looks like most people have read at least some of the Our Regenerative Future stories, which is fantastic. So we've got a good grounding of, of what the series is about. And again, most people are somewhat familiar with regenerative agriculture or very familiar. Um, that's fantastic. So I think we can start this conversation at a pretty high level. Um, I think now I would love to introduce um, or rather let our two panelists introduce themselves. Um, and invite them to perhaps weave into your introduction what farm resilience actually means to you. Um, let's start with you, Gary. Okay, thank you, Alina. Um, I suppose in terms of uh, background and on the property we have here, which is quite a small farm, it's, it's mainly a hill and so most of it's gone to forest. Well, it was most in pasture when we came here. <laughs> It's now largely in forest, um, and I mean it was a, it was a huge learning exercise for us. And um, I like to, you know, to sort of say that to people, you know, that um, when you make mistakes, that's good because that's how you learn. You only learn by doing things and then trying to work out um, what happened. Because a mistake is just sort of 
a, a happening which you can learn from. And, and it's really, that's what's really important, and I think, in terms of a regenerative type of agriculture, whatever you want to call it, you're going to be on a learning curve, you're going to be transitioning to something quite different. Um, you, that's really important that you make mistakes because that's what resilience is going to, is going to be about, really, uh, learning from your mistakes. But I, I think you've sort of done a brief introduction of, of uh, where I'm coming from. But I'd actually just like to talk a little wider about resilience because to me, it's, it's not something in itself. It, it's, a, it's in context with what's a healthy ecosystem. So there's a balance between productivity and resilience and there's a constant sort of interchange goes on that maintains both productivity and uh, resilience, which is like rep repair and protection of the system under either internal or external threats or hazards that, that come along. So I'd like to actually start not with agriculture, but with ourselves. Uh, I think it's maybe easy to understand resilience in that way because we're an ecosystem, right? We're living breathing ecosystem and when we take in food some of that food is for energy and vitality to do work and that right so we um, take in food we actually burn we burn carbs with oxygen which we breathe in and it's like burning in an in, in a, in a engine as well you actually burn and you cause damage by burning and so the system has to repair itself constantly and so there's this sort of balance going on and so some of the food is sort of straight carbs easy energy sugars, some of it's fats, slower burning, longer term energy, but all of that causes damage to our systems, to our cells, to our systems. So then we talk about antioxidants, right? Uh, and micronutrients that come in to do all the complicated repair, balancing, protection um, systems required to allow the body to remain healthy. So to me, we're healthy when we have the, the right balance between productivity or energy um, for work and repair protection type of res resilience. And uh, the, the tricky part of it is, is um, how our body knows w when to repair what, with what and how. And it's highly complicated and it's a very diverse system. And the response has to be what I, think is a really important word, in proportion. It's just be proportional to the issue or the problem, what's going on. Um, and to give an example of that, the body sometimes overreacts and you get lots of inflammation all around the body, like maybe it's happening with this coronavirus actually. And that's an overreaction, it's not in proportion and that's dangerous. So the question is how do we, um, maintain proportionality? How do we get the right information? So again, resilience to me comes from highly interconnected systems, which provide information, which allows proportionate action. So if you come to agriculture, and, and perhaps I will start with a more horticultural one, you need a lot of diversity, which is well connected. I mean, diversity in itself just doesn't work. You can throw a whole lot of stuff there, that doesn't work. It's got to be well connected. It's got to have the right feedback systems and it's got to make appropriate responses. And to try and do that with our small brains ourselves in a management way is really, really difficult. So to me, um, regenerating or regenerative agriculture is about nature doing all that work because she knows how to do it. She's been doing it for millions of years. And we just come in as a small amount of energy, a small amount of management that maybe then allows us to take some resources from that um, system and we give back by the way, by our actions and our intelligence. Um, because when you're trying to get a resilient system by putting that in there to kill that weed or putting that in there to kill that bug or putting that in there to give a bit of nutrient, just about all the time you're gonna be in wrong proportions and the system's not gonna work well. Um, and that's why I think our industrial agriculture is so lacking in resilience, it's so fragile for that reason. And that's why I see going over to something that is based on nature doing most of the work and thank you very much and getting things right and repairing things as, as it's required, then we're going to be much better off. So that would be my take on resilience. Thank you, Gary. 
Yeah, certainly a um, delicate balance to be to be managing out there on the farm. Um, Greg, over to you. Uh, Greg, have uh, have we got you on the line here? Just. Yeah, thanks, Just. Alina. <laughs> and um, kia ora, everybody. Um, I am on one of our classic rural, um, dodgy broadband connections, and so I might come and go a, a bit and, and miss a little bit. But, um, yeah, it's uh, great to be here today, and um, resilience is really probably what put us on our path in changing the way we were farming and managing Mangarara. And that journey began about 20 years ago. And, and um, at the time, I guess we were thinking about the future and it was, it was having our first child and, and thinking about uh, the world that, that they were going to inherit. And then um, I guess at that time, you know, sustainability was, was kind of in our thoughts and understanding that uh, pastoral agriculture in New Zealand is based upon bringing, you know, nutrients from the other side of the world to keep our, um, fertilizers on our pastures and, and keep the system growing and so that didn't seem a, a long-term sort of sustainable option for us and, and especially when we consider the amount of energy involved with that and, and finite resources and so that's sent us off on this very long journey which I'm sure is going to last the whole of my life and it has evolved over I guess the last 10 years or so of the awareness of the word regenerative agriculture um, and we don't get hung up on, on the words or, or the labels that we give it, but it is about the philosophy and the approach of working with nature, looking and learning from nature. And um, part, part of that also of regenerative agriculture is about building resilience into your system. And um, for us, you know, that, that does start with the soil and, um, and it's also been about building a whole lot of diversity into our system, which is, has been um, not just adding a whole lot of trees and um, creating that space for nature, as well as you know, different production systems, which leads to different um, income streams. But also it's um, been, been about you know, creating um, diverse sort of, you know, all the visitors that we get to, to our farm and a, and a whole lot of energy that sort of fuels us and keeps us going. And um, like Gary mentioned, I do think, you know, we can't leave out our personal resilience from this. And, and I think that has been a big part of, you know, the journey on the farm, because ultimately I think as we go through life and hopefully learn a few things along the way, we continue to evolve and deepen our understanding of, of what we're on this planet to do. And I think, you know, that starts to be reflected in the landscapes around us and, and hopefully, you know, there's our, our landscapes are, are a lot um, diverse and, and hopefully, you know, beauty is a big part of, of what we do here. And so I think, you know, that's been a personal journey and resilience also, as we've seen in Hawke's Bay this year, um, going through the drought and, and I guess, you know, with COVID and everything is um, community resilience, which has been really important too. And um, just acknowledging you know, that role of kindness and compassion and um, for people to support and look out for each other. So um, it is very broad, but um, yeah, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Right. We are experiencing a little bit of, um, of distortion with, with your video, Greg. Um, I'm thinking we might just um, turn, uh, turn off your video so the audio is coming through nice and clear if we're okay, if you're okay with that um, we'd love to be able yeah. to hear what you're saying yeah um, yeah I think in both of both of your answers there you, you really um, touched quite a lot on resilience beyond just thinking about the environment and that's something that often conversations around farm resilience are, are around the environmental factors so resilience from pests from extreme weather events from the sorts of droughts that we've seen um, the summer in the North Island. So, uh, Greg, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to that um, community or emotional or social resilience that you think regenerative farming can help facilitate. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, just, I guess, also, you know, as as a view of resilience, it, you know, it is um, about our landscapes and and the appropriate land use for for the different land classes, and um, the also it's it's the ability of of meeting you know the challenges that are just part of life, and um, but I guess the ones that we don't expect every day, and so that's just about not just bouncing back from those challenges that we face, but it's it's about bouncing forward so that we continue to evolve and adapt and um, you know, become more resilient to, to the um, challenges that, that the future undoubtedly holds. And um, I guess, you know, on, on a community level, you know, again, we have had, um, you know, Poppy Renton has, has become a bit of a hero in Hawke's Bay and starting a Facebook page, which has given us the ability to connect um, as farmers and support and just um, share stories and just, you know, especially people on farms to know that you're not alone out there and, and that there are others in the same boat. And, and I guess it was especially hard through COVID because um, the pubs were closed and we couldn't just, uh, you know, pop down and have a yarn with, with all your mates over that time. So, you know, it was important to be able to connect and communicate and have that, that support. Yeah, absolutely. It's wonderful to see the farmers going online too, as well as all, all us city folk who are working, working from our home offices. Um, Gary, did you have anything you wanted to add around um, social and um, community resilience? I know you've been working in this space a long time. Uh, yeah, well, the, the whole idea of, of growing food is to feed people and it's, it's not, uh, well, it shouldn't be somebody doing one part of it and the other people are at the way at the end of some system and, and just buying in the supermarket. I mean, I think it's really important. Um, there's not many um, community supported sort of agricultural sort of systems in New Zealand. There's one or two. It's, it's, it's very prevalent in North America in particular. Um, but there are, there are different ways in which um, we can connect people between, um, you know, urban and rural and, and everything in between. I think that's, that's what's really important. I think for any food system to be, to be resilient requires, again, good conductivity. And that means human conductivity as much as, you know, we tend to think of it as just something to do with nature. Well, we're nature too. <laughs> and we have to connect with each other and we have to support each other. And we have to find ways of feeding back information which is, which is appropriate and helpful. And, and I have to say, I mean, I, I come from a farming background. My um, parents were farmers and my, I still have a lot of family of farmers and, and that, and so my wife's the same. Um, a lot of the feedback's not always helpful because <laughs> it's not um, aimed at trying to uh, help with the appropriate action that should be taken. Um, and so I think it's really important that people do uh, relate um, to their food and try to understand it more, trying to um, what's behind that food and what's the uh, effect on both people and our wider environment um, from the, our, our farming methods and how can we help everybody in the system to be healthier. You know, and then you can come back to, you know, to health because I mean a well-functioning ecosystem is we can call it healthy. So our food supply system needs to be healthy in terms of right from right through. And, and of course, the problem is at the moment it's not. It's very unhealthy in its sort of very linear connections, long distance transport, um, poor feedback between the people in the, along the chain. Um, so very much um, it, it, the sort of, when I was with people trying to promote organics and that, it was very much about people understanding where the food came from, how they can be involved with it. So it, it's actually, you know, it's, it's just as vital that part of the system as what happens on the farm. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Healthy food, yeah, healthy agree. people, healthy communities. Yeah. Greg, did you want to add something? Yeah. yeah, just I'd agree with that too, because I mean, it's been a big part of our journey is, is connecting people back with the farm. And um, I think that loss of connection is, is one of the biggest issues that results in, you know, the, the challenges, whether it be climate change or social issues and health issues out there is just that loss of connection with um, understanding how food is grown, where it's coming from. And, that, and so that's, that's a big part of, of this is educating and connecting people back to the land um, so they can make more informed choices and 
that whole thing about understanding that every dollar they spend um, particularly on food is, is a vote for the kind of future we're going to have. So um, yeah, connecting people back to the land and farms is really important. Mm, thanks, Greg. I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience um, this summer. You, of course, are in Hawke's Bay where there was a, a pretty brutal drought. Um, can you speak a little bit as to um, how it was in the Hawke's Bay and um, how you dealt with that on your, on your property? Yeah, um, we you know, gear up like most Hawke's Bay farmers for dry summers. Um, but I guess the way we do this a little bit differently is by um, having higher pasture covers and using holistic grazing management. So um, we do take more grass into the summer. So we've kind of got a hay shed full of grass already on our farm, which we can um, graze down you know, through, through that summer. And you know, that, that is all about um, you know, taller grasses you know, with deeper root systems going into the ground. So accessing water deeper, you know, deeper in the soil profile. And also, you know, we're always wanting to keep the soil covered with our holistic grazing. And um, so, you know, the soil is never exposed to the sun and, and, and drying it out. And, um, and then we have longer rest periods. So, you know, while we, we don't graze it right to the ground um, through, through that summer initially, and, um, you know, give it a longer rest period so that it can recover. And um, so we, we did have, you know, good pasture and plenty of feed for our animals right through the summer where we sort of get a little bit um, where it got tough for us is when we don't get rain in April and May and because you kind of expect it to, to be raining there. And so we um, got through the summer perfectly OK. And um, but we have had to reduce our stock numbers going into this winter. But again, um, you know, grass grows grass and our um, pasture covers have bounced back really well and so we're in a position basically now to um, restock stop the farm and um, we have saved ourselves a lot of stress through this time because it has been really hard for a lot of farmers and um, you know there's been farmers that have been feeding out to their stock since February and um, yeah and that's tough and it's really expensive um, we haven't bought any um, feed and you know we haven't applied any nitrogen um, but we're, we're still you know, farming very profitably and each day at the moment I'm going out and shifting my animals and they're going into to pastures, you know, almost up to their knees and, and you know, they're well fed and, and um, you know, the other really big benefit of, of just this approach is, is um, you know, for the mental well-being and welfare of, of the farmers and it does take a lot of, lot of stress off and, you know, because we all love to see our animals, you know, healthy and, and doing well and being well fed and so, um yeah, we've we've been able to do that, which is which has been really cool. Yeah, it's great. It's great to see a sort of a cascading series of effects there. If you've got a resilient farm, then the animals are more healthy. The farmers are faring better in terms of stress. Um, and really interesting to hear how those kind of regenerative methods um, can be helping retain the water. I know we, we spoke last week with um, Jeff Check from the Rodale Institute, who of course is a global leader on regenerative agriculture. And um, I think they've been running a 40 year study, I think, um, talking about, or well, one of the findings is how um, in drought years, the organic crops tend to fare a lot better than, than conventional ones. Um, so I'd love to ask a question now um, which has come from Barbara Hay um, and refers to a Dominion Post article this morning, actually, um, a story called Fertilizers Are Vital. Um, so perhaps this is a question for Gary, um, but that there are mis the, the article says there are misconceptions around soil health and regenerative agriculture, namely that fertilizer is counterproductive to both. This just isn't true. Um, this is a quote. Most New Zealand soils, for example, are naturally poor in phosphorus. Um, your thoughts on that, Gary? Well, yeah, that's probably a big question, isn't it? I mean, um, they're actually not poor in phosphorus, they're poor in available phosphorus more, actually. But, um, and, and sometimes these details are, are important. Um, so, um, yeah, well, it goes right back to the heart of the, of the system you're trying to do in terms of um, fertilizer. I mean, systems obviously work well 
themselves in nature they have for you know we've come along and we've changed the approach and particularly the problem with artificial synthetic fertilizers is it actually suppresses natural fertility of, of the system because it it actually re reduces the soil life and the structure of your soils it gets affected and and it doesn't regenerate properly i mean going on from what greg said in terms of like if you've got a system uh, of that type of grazing he talks about, then you've got more soil life, you've got better moisture holding capacity, the whole system has got much more, um, what you say, yeah, capacity to, to last through um, events like droughts or whatever it is, or, or storms as well, because you've got the cover on that. So the problem with the, the artificial fertilizers is, is, is it dumbs down the whole natural system and makes it much more fragile. So of course, you're, you're, then you're stuck with it. Then you, you've got no reserves, so you have to keep applying it. Um, and, and then because it's, the soil life is not active and it's not really a balanced system, then you get pest problems, you know, might come in, grass scrub things might come in or whatever might come infect your, your pastures or your crops or whatever. Um, and so you just get in the vicious cycle of more and more fertilizer and then more and more pesticides and herbicides and all sorts of other things that are going on that just spiral you into it. So yeah, you, 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 can, you can keep doing that if you can keep getting hold of the fertilizers, if, you can, if you've keep got all that oil all that, to run all those machineries to do it all, no, you can do it. But at some point we've got to get off that. <laughs> we've got to get back to much more using the natural fertility there and generate more natural fertility so that then we can get a surplus for ourselves from that. And, um, and the biggest issue to me is the, I suppose the most problematic agriculture to me, I start, put it this way, is what requires tilling because of our annuals. And that's basically vegetables and arable crops. They're annual crops. They need to be replanted every year. You need to do something and prepare the soil for it. And then you've got to look at the competition that comes from that prepared bare soil, which we call weeds or whatever it is. So you get into really a vicious cycle. And, and so to put my cards on the table, I'm much more in favor or sympathetic to perennial systems. Um, when you talk about perennials, most people talk about, or think about trees and horticulture net. But what Greg's talk about is a perennial system involving grasslands and large animals, grazing, recycling, uh, the nutrients, building up the soil carbon, et cetera, et cetera. And it does it without having to till the soil, without, without taking off the cover, right? So our most problematic agriculture to me is our staples, our wheat and oats and our veggies and the way it's grown in an industrial system. And if you knew, if people knew what was put on those veggies when they were growing, I live in the Horofenua, and I could take you to places where they pour on toxic chemicals, one after the other after the other and artificial fertilizers. Now that grows a type of vegetable, but how good is that vegetable for you? It comes out of a very unhealthy uh, environment to me, and it's not that good in terms of keeping us healthy. So I think the people who talk about say, oh yeah, no, where our soils are okay and we can keep applying fertilizer, need to step back and say, well, what are you trying to do here? You know, What sort of food are we trying to grow? Um, you know, what's the quality of that food in terms of uh, its vitality and, and, and that. So uh, personally, I, I mean, I've heard this argument, well, this thing so many times, I sort of put it to one side and I said, look, you do your own thing, you do your industrial agriculture. You know, let's get on with the people who want to get on with, with um, growing food well and, and in a way that gives you good natural fit, uh, fertility and vitality. Yes, I think, I think that's an interesting point there around investigating where the benchmark is that people um, keep pointing out that New Zealand has uh, world-leading agricultural systems. And we certainly do do a lot of things well, um, but we, we still do them in a, in a very unnatural way compared to how nature would be managing a system. Um, you made a good point there around um, fossil fuels and um, farm science in a in an uncertain future in terms of fossil fuels. And I, Greg, I know that you talked about that quite a lot in your article in terms of, um, of reducing reliance on, 
on imports from outside of the country and particularly in this time of, of global pandemic and the realization that this could be something that's in our future as waves of these sorts of global shocks. Can you speak a little bit to um, the, the ceasing reliance so much on fossil fuels on your property? Absolutely. Um, and But just also like to cover off that question about fertiliser because it is key and, and it is fascinating and I can't answer it, but I was um, involved with a, a forum, the Better Futures Forum, um, and sort of putting in some feedback to what that group is doing at the moment. And of course, the issue of you know, fertiliser arises. And the reality is that you know, the current system, system is not sustainable and so therefore we have to look at alternatives and that's what sent, set us off down this path and like um, Gary said you know we are focusing on um, perennial production and um, and creating those natural nutrient cycles as much as possible and returning as much back to the to the soil as we can and you know ideally um, as far as our sheep and beef production on this farm then you know I'd love to have a, a local abattoir and um, where we can compost, you know, the waste that doesn't get eaten by humans, not the waste, but the materials that are not um, consumed by humans back into, into the farm system. It'd be great to get the bones back because I think my understanding is that, you know, the phosphorus that we lose from our system is, is largely in the bones of the animals. And, and so again, there's, there's ways of, um, composting them, burning them back and reapplying it back to the soil. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but, you know, I've, I've heard people talk about, um, you know, peak water, peak oil and these challenges we face and peak phosphate is possibly another one that's right up there this century. And so we do have to, you know, recycle as much as we can and keep it on, on our properties. But, you know, I think we're going to have to look at um, an opportunity and, and Gary really appreciate permaculture thinking is the problem is the solution. And I know our local councils are having issue with their sewage ponds and that at the moment, but you know, if that could be processed like it is in some countries around the world and, and again, replied back in, back into our nutrient cycles. And I guess the other really big opportunity at the moment is um, through harvesting seaweed and perhaps capturing some of those nutrients that end in the ocean and getting them back onto our land as well. So that's cool. And um, yeah, with, with the fertile, getting rid of the fossil fuels, um, we haven't gone down the track of those beautiful sunflowers that are in that picture behind you, Alina, and done those diverse crops. And um, just because, you know, I guess we were looking a little bit further ahead and, and you know, there's a lot of energy involved with, you know, cultivating and, and harvesting all those seeds and bringing them from all around you know, the country and, and getting them in. And I do appreciate at the moment that um, guys doing that are getting amazing results and we've got the energy. And so you might as well do that because they're getting some really great responses um, and benefits to their soil. And, um, but, you know, we're trying to get that diversity through our grazing management and also through planting trees. And I think the really big opportunity that we are missing at the moment in New Zealand is through silver pasture and agroforestry and including um, trees into our landscape with grazing animals and a whole integrated system, you know, where um, there is a lot of opportunity at the moment um, through um, carbon schemes to, to get extra income, you know, from, from the land by clipping the carbon ticket while it's, while it's here. Um, but, you know, again, through, through diversity, um, we are also going to be creating a bit of stock fodder for, for animals through drought periods. You know, we can include some fruit and nut trees, you know, in our, in our lines of, of um, trees that we're planting in our pastures. And, um, you know, and it's just creating that whole biodiversity, which, you know, we just had a young fella just started working for us today and we're out shifting um, cattle and hadn't seen, whenever we shift cattle, we just get this big flock of birds come around our place and you know because the grass is longer there's the insects have had more time to breed and and so as you put cattle into new pasture every day they obviously kicking up a few insects and, and it's a it's a feast for for um birds and again that's i think part of starting these natural cycles and back to those natural nutrient cycles you know the manure from from those birds that's going into the system and the insects and you know we're just connecting it all up again and and reconnecting a lot of those natural cycles. 
Yeah, the trees, the trees are an interesting one and super important. And I think it was Kay Baxter who made the point in, in her article um, that the trees can often access the stores of phosphate that are much deeper down that pastures or other diverse um, pastoral plants can't get to. Um, Absolutely. And, and there's also the animal welfare issues too. You know, um, if we are to, you know, our export markets are going to, we want to be the best of the best and our animal welfare um, has to be right up there. And so um, I think it's important, especially, you know, in hot, dry Hawke's Bay that there's shade and shelter um, for our animals. So it, it ticks all the, all the boxes and, um, you know, while there's, you know, opportunities through different council incentives and billion trees, well, not so much billion trees, unfortunately, that's all about, um, you know, there is opportunities to get native plantings on the farm, but so much of it is just, you know, blanket planting of trees. Um, but yet there is this opportunity of, of sequestering the carbon and um, continuing to produce food as we do it and, and increasing the income that we're earning off the land at the same time and also building that resilience. Stopping wind, putting shade and um, so yeah that's that's a real opportunity. Mm. Yeah there's a big question there about what sort of trees we're planting isn't there? Um, next week uh, at seven o'clock next Monday we have got a episode on regenerative forestry and we'll be speaking in that one with Dame Anne Salmond, uh, Dr. David Hall and Ramona Radford, um, who's um, coming at it from a te ao Māori perspective in terms of forest regeneration. So that's going to be a super exciting um, high octane uh, webinar, I think. Um, some amazing people on that panel as well. But um, Greg, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about um, how you're approaching the mix of, of different trees you're planting on your farm. Um, and then, then Gary, I'd love to circle back to you with a related question as well. But Greg, um, if you want to comment on that first. Yeah, so I guess, you know, we're very fortunate that we formed a partnership with Air New Zealand 10 years ago, because you know, I don't think we'd be forming one just at the moment. But um, that, that has enabled us to identify some of the steeper, more erosion prone land on our farm. And, and so um, with that community support or support from in New Zealand, um, we've planted um, areas that have been, you know, livestock are excluded and that is just for nature and regeneration. So we've identified those parts of the land um, and obviously, you know, waterways are all fenced off and planted. And then um, there is, the matter of just integrating trees through the pastoral system and and again you know taking our learnings from nature um, diversity is the key and so um, we've planted you know many kinds of, of trees um, through the pasture and, and that's an area that we're going to keep keep expanding on so um, yeah and, and of course so it's just matching right tree right places as our first part of that decision making process. Thanks, Greg. Um, Gary, I want to put to you a question that came through um, in the registration from somebody um, when, they, when they signed up for this webinar. But can you speak to any implications of the over-reliance on fast-growing non-natives, such as, as poplar and, and willow on farms? Okay, Lena, if I can just um, back up slightly with what Greg said, because I'm sort of, yes, 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 to everything oh. he's, he's saying there, and, and, and just, comment I'd like to make is that you know trees are nutrient accumulators and they accumulate within the soil and then the groundwater will take those nutrients across the, the land and so how you how you have trees on a, on a landscape is really important in terms of accumulating and feeding your maybe your pastoral areas or your or your vegetable grown areas or whatever there's there's a whole interconnection in the landscape um, in terms of where you put trees and 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 the benefits like what Greg talked about with the shade and the shelter and, and all that, but the nutrient accumulation is really important. And, um, and so there has to be a sort of a, an accumulative side as well as a sort of a, a take side. So there's a give and take. So you do take um, um, nutrients off the farm, but you can also accumulate them on the farm by, by doing things with trees. And, and just, I'd like to touch on the other point you made about birds because birds are great um, spreaders of, of uh, nutrients and seabirds in particular. And um, 
well, the feelings that we have are always more like had huge lumps of seabirds in New Zealand. And that was one of the main ways that um, the nutrients from the sea get recycled back to the land is by seabirds. Unfortunately, a lot of our seabirds are declining in numbers quite drastically. So we're losing that uh, recycling ability of birds, um, particularly um, nutrients from the sea back to the land. Um, so that said, then what's the role of different trees uh, is a really interesting question. Um, and a lot of it comes down to um, speed, I suppose, timing. Um, it's like it, if you want to sequester carbon, for instance, actually the quickest way is what Greg's doing because uh, grasslands and animals will sequester it more quickly. They won't sequester it as much as trees and forests will in the end. So in the end, a um, uh, forest, particularly in its growth phase, will sequester a lot of carbon and then even it's in its mature phase, uh, will soon re re hold that carbon re and recycle it. Um, so a lot of the trees that we grow, um, like poplars for soil conservation purposes on the hill country, um, because they grow fast and they have deep roots and they help to stabilize the land more quickly. Um, and so the same with, I'm well aware of from my professional work on rivers that we use willows along river edges because they grow fast, they actually accumulate, take out um, too much nutrients from rivers very quickly. Um, and they can be managed to very easily to um, and try and reduce erosions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why they're used. Um, if you're going to use uh, a wider range of trees, then the first thing you'd have to do, for instance, along rivers, if I can go on that one, is give them a lot more room, the river more space, have much wider berms and much uh, more extent of vegetation along them. Um, it's a bit the same um, in agriculture as well that, I mean, I think you can use willows as an initial um, uptake of nutrients when you've got over uh, excessive nutrient loads. Uh, and um, that's true of quite a lot of our wetlands and, and waterways. Um, but then they are a great nurse crop for natives as well. Natives will come through uh, willows very, very easily. And um, the birds come in, they eat the buds, they poop, <laughs> drop the seed, the natives can come through, all sorts of reasons why. So to me, I don't think it's an either or. And, and if we started talking about horticulture, well, it's even more difficult because virtually all our horticultural crops, even diverse food forest ones, come from other ecosystems outside New Zealand. And we put together trees from all different ecosystems, put them together, uh, and think, well, no, how are they going to grow as a, as a sort of um, a well-functioning ecosystem now with all these different ones coming from different places. And so there's, there's a whole question around there that I haven't got time to go into, but, but to me, it's, um, it's from a permaculture perspective, I say, well, what's there? What works well? And how can we progress it? Or how, what succession can we have? I don't think it's an either or. Um, it's a matter of, um, it's, again, it's a matter of diversity of thinking and diversity of action and, and that, and we can't sort of suddenly jump from one thing to another. Or well, if we do, we're going to have lots of consequences. So it, it's, it's a question that's a very quick, good question, but it, it's, it's a very long answer. <laughs> I haven't got time to go much further. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. We've got, we've got plenty of things to explore um, on this webinar. And the questions that we don't get to, um, we'll try and address some of those on the Pure Advantage social media in the coming weeks so we can keep this conversation going. Um, there's a little bit of debate going on here in the Q&A around the role of cattle um, with a question or, or somebody pointing out that Dr. Paul Winton has been in Gisborne on a speaking tour around climate change and one of his major mess messages to decarbonise is to phase out cattle farming and plant many more trees, mainly pine. So I think we, we've debated that one a little bit and we'll be absolutely diving into the pine versus natives more next week. Um, but what, what are your takes on, on phasing out ruminants as far as regenerative agriculture goes? I know there's been a lot of discussion around this and, and the, the role of, of a whole systems approach. So Greg, perhaps we'll start with you and then, and then we'll hear your take on it, Gary. Yeah, my understanding and, and you know, this is an area that needs more work. And so, 
you know, looking at um, white pastures um, farm, white oak pastures in, in, in America who have done that analysis, looking at um, their cattle production and what, they, what that's doing to greenhouse gases and, and comparing it with the impossible burger type, you know, vegetarian um, diet. And, you know, I think part of regenerative agriculture, and it is a paradigm shift, is um, the understanding that um, humans and our systems that we are managing can be part of healing and um, doing good on the planet, as opposed to um, a lot of discussion, which is about just doing less bad. And so, you know, fr from that study and, and a lot of work that is, that is underway now, and understanding that pastoral grazing systems with ruminants are going to be sequestering more carbon than they are emitting. Um, I was listening to a, a, a web um, podcast yesterday. Uh, it's called The Regenerative Agriculture Journey Out of Australia. And, and they're doing some interesting research at the moment and research indicating that by um, feeding um, seaweeds, and the enzymes in the seaweed um, can reduce methane from animals by 90%. And um, so when you add, you know, diverse pastures and, and that, I think, you know, again, you know, there's reduced amounts of methane coming there. I don't think we fully understand the role of methanotrophic um, bacteria in the soils and their ability to sequester methane. And, um, and, and so, I mean, you know, sheep and beef farming in New Zealand, we're already 30% below what um, our greenhouse gas emissions were in 1990. So, you know, that is part of a natural cycle and it's an essential part, as Gary said, you know, harvesting um, that fast growing grasses and, and completing those, those carbon cycles going needs animals as part, of, as part of that. And so, you know, and there's the whole, you know, fertility role that they have and, and, and the nutrients that they are returning back to the ground and all the microbiology associated with that. And so, um, think that I don't believe that that um, yeah we should be removing animals and particularly um, ruminants and cattle from um, our food system I think it's an essential part of it but incorporating trees and incorporating the whole lot thanks Greg anything you'd like to add to that Gary yeah well my comment would be it's it's not um, what you're doing it's how you're doing it mm. Um, which is really important and, and, and it depends, we keep saying in permaculture, it depends, it depends on the place, depends on the climate, depends on the landscape. You know, there's certain areas where you can really grow trees really well in certain areas which are grasslands. Grasslands with large animals are part of the ecosystems of the world. Um, you know, we, we can manage them well or we can, and we can manage them very poorly. Um, because we're very poorly managing um, pastoral animal farming doesn't mean to say that it has no place anywhere in the world or that we can't do it well like what Greg is saying so it, it's much more about how how do we go about doing it um, because it's all very well um, saying we'll put it all in, in the forest and I'll come back to the point I made that how our veggies are growing and that sort of thing and that's probably the most destructive type of in, in industrial agriculture in terms of what's doing to the, to the, to the soils and the local environment. Um, and so it's, yeah, I mean, we can, we can sequester carbon in all sorts of different ways. And, and it comes back to diversity again. It's how the, as I said earlier, how the trees are in the landscape along with what the grasslands, along with what might be done with some of vegetables and that. And you can grow veggies along the edges of forest really easily. That's where a lot of them come from. Um, it's just that we don't do that. Um, and, to, and to sort of say, they take this sort of blanket thing, no, no, we've just got to get out of ruminants. I mean, it's like, well, we, okay, then we should just get, get out of, of um, the type of market gardening we're doing now because, man, that's so destructive. And, and when you talk about methane, I mean, it's how it gets recycled is the issue, not that producing methane. The places that produce the most methane are tropical rainforests. They produce huge amounts of methane, far more than a pastoral farm will do but it gets recycled within the system. Wetlands are great for producing methane, that's what they do. There's a breakdown system where they produce methane. Um, and we get hung up on sort of the methane we measure 
somewhere on the farm and we don't consider the methane we don't measure in our wetlands and forests and we somehow think the methane on the farm is bad and the methane in the forest well we just ignored that you know, I, I just don't think our county is very good at all frankly so uh, and that's why that's why again the, the feedback information is not appropriate and so we keep making in my opinion the wrong choices and uh, uh, unless we get the information you know a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more accurate then i think we'll keep making these sort of broad statements about it has to be like this has to be like that that's the problem with our culture it's just like it's okay we've got a problem find a solution that's the solution just do that we don't mm -hmm. think about connections we don't think about consequences we don't think about the whole interaction that's mm -hmm. going to take place from from that particular action and that's what we need to do. We need to think about what are all the consequences? What are all the ramifications that are going to take place from doing that? Right? Socially, economically, environmentally, yeah? culturally too. Right? Yeah, I think and herein lies the problem with um, our predominant reductionist scientific inquiry to measure all these small parts of an inherently complex system. Um, we have a few more minutes here and there's been a couple of comments around bees. So I'd just love to talk a little bit about peas and pollination and, and Barry Foster's pointed, out, pointed people here towards the um, Trees for Bees website and incorporating important sources of pollen and nectar. Um, but there's a question that came through with the registrations um, that I'd love to ask you, Gary. What do you know about pollination security and threats such as the fallen economics of beekeeping? Well, I used to do, do beekeeping myself before the varroa mite came and <laughs> it was very difficult to do it without um, chemicals, but I, only in a small scale. And I, I'm, I'm no expert on, on, that, on those pollination th um, questions, really. I mean, I, I just do note, though, that our insects are in huge decline, not just bees. Um, and that's clearly because of, in my opinion, all the toxins that are spread around our landscape and, and, and insects get particularly affected as the soil life. Um, so we have a wider issue, I think, than just, you know, pollination of some crops. I mean, insects, uh, you know, a huge slot of biomass and lands insects, and, and, and they have a really incredible role to play in any ecosystem. And, and we tend to ignore them because they're too small. Um, we think about bees because we know they pollinate some of our crops that we need to have pollinated. Um, but we really need to look after, again, a wider question than just bees. And so, yeah, we, we, we can look at what might be affecting the bees and colony collapse and these sort of things that are going on and, and why that's the case. But, um, you know, we do have frogs in our ponds here in our place, but frogs are disappearing all over the place too, you know. And all these creatures have a role in nutrient recycling that's important for the ecosystems. And, and so, you know, people say, oh, no, no, we can, we can just put fertilizer on or whatever, come back to that same question. You see? Um, until you get off that sort of bandwagon. Um, and, and the bees, it's just, it's just another one part of the whole, the whole issue, really. Mm, thanks, Gary. We've got just a few minutes left here. So I'd love to finish with, um, asking you both there's been a, a question um on the chat for a while here around the transition from traditional to regenerative agriculture farming and and how you've navigated them um, perhaps we can incorporate that question with um with the subject of of resilience so i'm thinking um and it'd be a nice way to finish if you could perhaps give um one example each of what do you think what would be the first step um, or if, if you could only take one step to make your farm um, a little bit more regenerative and more resilient, what would be the first thing that you would do? Gary, we'll start with you. Well, I'll tell you what I did do, plant trees and then, then take stock off and allow trees to grow naturally. I mean, um, I mean, trees are great for all sorts of reasons that Greg's touched on as well. Um, and the comment I'd make though is it, it's part of a diversified landscape and and so what type of trees becomes important as well as so it goes back to the question you know, it depends but um, that's certainly what I'd start to do but I mean if someone's wanted to do the transition 
then, yeah, they, uh, from, say, it depends where you're coming from, where you're coming from market gardens or whether you're coming from, from um, pasture. But say, say I take a market garden one, because that's really hard. Then you need an area of grassland, you might say, which is your nutrient source or uh, margin trees, which is your nutrient source for your veggies that you're growing. Because you're taking a lot out of a small area when you're growing veggies and you need to get nutrients back into it. So if you're not going to do it through artificial fertilizers and have all those sprays, then you need to do it through either uh, managing the grassland and bringing the grasses uh, fertility into the uh, back garden area, which you can sort of do by catch, cut and carry, or then, or use trees in an appropriately sided way that will accumulate and you've got to check where the water's flowing, where the groundwater's are flowing and how that happens to get the nutrients to, to the market garden area. And, and that's not easy, but, but that's where it's that's where to start. Thank you, Gary. Greg, one thing that you would do. Um, I think the first thing that you have to do is understand that it is quite a mind shift. And I think the way that you achieve that is probably by going and visiting another farmer that's, you know, already on the regenerative agriculture path. And because generally, you know, I think that is the, the hardest step to make because once you've made that step and you open yourself up to the possibilities, you'll find that people that are already on the path and it is becoming a groundswell at the moment, which is really exciting. And you find that these farmers um, are really excited about their farming and are really happy to share their experiences, their learnings, their failures and everything like that. We've got these you know, amazing groups like Quorum Sense and I know Taranaki, Northland, Hawke's Bay, we all have our own regenerative agriculture Facebook groups and ways of connecting. And so first and foremost, um, open yourself up to the possibilities and um, then you're on the way. Yeah, I think with all of this regeneration um, conversation, the, the mind shift is, is going to be the most uh, important and probably the most challenging thing for us mm -hmm. all, to, yeah. all to put in place. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Just want to thank you both again um, for taking the time to be part of this conversation today. Um, it's been wonderful to have you both on here. Um, we have come up to the top of the hour. Um, I wish we had more time to get through some of these magnificent questions, but as I said, we'll try to address them on the social media. Um, please do join us next week for that regenerative forestry session. I think it's going to be a super exciting conversation with Dana Ann Salmon, who's been doing a lot in space and Dr. David Hall has been uh, producing quite a lot of work for Pure Advantage in this area along with Ramona Radford as well. Um, upcoming webisodes beyond that um, on the Mondays are uh, Trent Yeo um, and Dr. Suzanne will be talking um, regenerative tourism, um, urban agriculture with um, Sheldon Levitt, Sarah Smuts, Kennedy, Barry, Bailey Perriman and, and Daniel Sherman. So that's representing um, people from all over the country working on urban agriculture. And we'll be coming back with a uh, regenerative economy conversation um, as our final episode. And we haven't yet finalised who those speakers are going to be. So if there's anybody you want to hear again from, please do send through um, those recommendations. Um, so thank you so much again for joining us and we will catch you next week. Thanks again to our panelists. Thanks, Gary. Thanks. Kakite.